Thank you very much. What an incredible uh, welcome and introduction. Thank you so much, and thank you for having me here this evening. Um, I have one tip for you. Never, ever go on a stage after uh, Dr. Simon Hackett, and definitely never go on a stage after a wonderful poet like Tane. Thank you so much, both of you. You were absolutely wonderful. Um, so tonight I wanted to speak to you about art as the highest form of hope because for me art is the highest form of hope. It's our anchor. It's what keeps us harnessed into the world. It's what keeps us together. It's what keeps us grounded in those uncharted waters that so many of us have experienced throughout our lives. Art has the power to communicate. It has the power to console. It has the power to challenge us. But most of all, for me, it has the power to connect. To connect us to each other, to connect us to the artist. At one point in time, the artist created what we're looking at, what we're hearing, what we're feeling. There was a communication there between them and us, and it's personal. Creative self-expression is one of the ultimate indicators of humanity. Often we use restriction from the arts as a punishment. With good art, and I say good art, Controversial, I know. Um, we can soothe our pain. We can soften hearts, the hardest of hearts. I have seen the hardest of hearts cry at the most beautiful of symphonies. It can lift us up. It can lift us up when we are so down that nothing else can touch the sides. Nothing else has the redeeming quality of a piece of poetry or a form of words or the sight of a painting that we recognize from previous days. And especially that song by Rihanna. Is that Rihanna? <laughs> Who's playing Rihanna? <laughs> Hey, don't worry, it's absolutely fine. You know, it's usually me that does that, so please don't worry at all. It's absolutely fine. You've got good taste in music. Art inspires us. It enlightens us. It shapes and it molds us. I remember when I was really young, um, yeah, probably, I don't know, almost half a decade ago, I don't, half a century ago, rather, um, making myself younger, we had a teacher in our school who was absolutely obsessed with Peter and the Wolf. Any of you were played Peter and the Wolf when you were in assemblies? Yeah, lots of nods. I think it must have been part of teacher training in the 60s, maybe, that you played children Peter and the Wolf. And it's a piece of music that each of the characters has their own theme tune. And she used to put it on. She used to get the record player out. Yes, I'm that old. Uh, get the record player out. And she would play the different uh, theme tunes for each of the different characters. And we couldn't put our hand up quick enough to say, oh, I know, that's the woodcutter. Or that's Peter's tune. And still to this day, 50 years later, I still, whenever I hear it, when I'm driving, when I'm wherever I am and the radio's on and I hear any of those theme tunes, I can still recognize them. And I go right back to that terribly uncomfortable parquet floor and the smell of our school hall. And that's what art does, isn't it? It takes us back. It allows us to access the past. It triggers our memories. And do you know, even with the most brilliant uh, scans and MRIs and whatever people can see inside our brains now, we still don't really understand how that works. How does art, how does music take us back to a time that really we shouldn't really be able to remember? Art molds us. It makes us the people that we are. And that is why it's so important that our young people have access to the arts today. Without good art, 
the world would be drained of its colour. It would be drained of all of that creativity and those moments where we connect. A little while ago, I, um, I was asked by the Speakers Collective, which is a collective of people who um, share their lived experience of uh, mental health challenges and lots of different experiences that they've had in the world, and they speak publicly. And I was invited as part of the Speakers Collective to go to the National Gallery and talk uh, during Mental Health Awareness Week. And I wondered what to say. What could I say to the staff at the National Gallery um, about my experience? And I thought, I'm going to tell them about my anchor. What was it in choppy seas that kept me anchored? What was it that gave me that grounding in those uncharted waters? And it was this painting here that you see tonight. Does anybody know the artist? I'm going to give you 10 points if you know this artist. Anybody? Okay, I get to keep the money. It's, um, it's a portrait by Gerald Leslie Brockhurst and it was painted in 1934 and it's called Jeunesse Doré. It is a portrait of Kathleen Woodward and me and Kathleen go back a long way because in October 2003 it was the best of times and the worst of times. I got my first job in the art world and it was exactly where I'd always wanted to be. I uh, took a job. I was one of the people who greet you as you first walk in the gallery. And I would do anything to be near those artworks. Um, so I was one of those people for a long time. It meant that I got to see all the internal jobs that were floating around. So I quickly progressed up the ladder, but not before I had got to spend every day in front of this beautiful painting. That was October 2003, and in the same month, unfortunately, and nobody knew that this was going to happen, I also became bereaved by suicide. It was very out of the blue, and it meant that October 2003 for me was the very best of times, but the very worst of times as well. I made a decision to carry on working in the art world because... I needed to feel grounded. I needed something to carry on. I needed, like many of you here, and I'm getting lots of nods of recognition here, sometimes when you go through the worst of times, you need to keep some balance. You need something to keep you grounded. You need to keep going, even when all seems impossible. So every day I would go into the art gallery where I was working. Um, she lives in the Lady Lever Art Gallery in Port Sunlight on the Wirral. If any of you ever want to go up that way and visit her, she's, she's still there. And every time I walked past her, she's looking at me now. Every time I walked past her, I felt a connection. I felt like she was there silently telling me it's going to be okay. There was something about her and me, we just gave, I just gave her a nod every morning when I walked past. And there was something wonderful about knowing that no matter what had happened before, she'd still be there every morning. I read about when she was painted and the story was beautiful. And I thought, if you're still there, I can still be here too. And every day we did that together. She was my anchor. She gave me the calmness, she gave me the connection, she gave me the belief that if she was still there, I could still be here too. It's a long time since I've seen her, the original painting, but actually I have a replica of her at home because it reminds me of the best of times and how art can give us the hope that we need when it feels like all hope is lost. For other people, they find their artworks, their connection, their anchor in much bigger ways. And I wanted to share this picture. What's this artwork called? <laughs> the Angel of the North. Who's the sculptor? 
Sir Anthony Gormley. Thank you so much. You see, I knew I'd give those, paints, those points away eventually. There is something wonderful, isn't there, about being beneath an artwork that is bigger than you. There is something wonderful about being engulfed by an artwork, by feeling as if you are not the biggest person. You are not. You gives you perspective. And it's really, really interesting because when Anthony Gormley created this piece in 1998, he talked about the angel as he wanted to make an object that would be the focus of hope at a painful time of transition for the people in the Northeast, which is where the Angel of the North is. It was an abandoned place in a gap between industrial the industrial age and the information age, and it felt very stuck. So Anthony Gormley wanted to create this piece. This piece is actually as high as five double-decker buses. It has the wingspan of a jumbo jet. It weighs 200 tonnes in what you can see here as a sculpture, but below that is 500 tonnes of concrete as its foundations. She is very rarely alone. Visitors go to her, they are attracted to her, they spend time with her. The Angel of the North speaks to hope. The hope that whatever was in Anthony Gormley's head actually became a reality. Our dreams can come true. He used his own body in this artwork. The body of the angel is actually his body. It's a corporeal piece. It is based on his own body, like many of his works are. But again, when we think about hope, it gives us all hope, doesn't it, that actually maybe our dreams, as unrealistic as they looked on paper, and he, he, this, this nearly never happened so many times, this piece. It gives us hope that actually other people can believe in our dreams too. And we've got hope that that can happen. There are other ways that we can share hope through artworks and, and, and demonstrate that it's the highest form of hope. In 2016, um, an organisation called Hospital Rooms, a charity called Hospital Rooms, was established. And I'm an extremely proud um, trustee of Hospital Rooms. I went to them. I knocked on their door. Somebody told me about them. A, a sculptor um, told me about their work, and I became fascinated. As somebody who spent the last two decades with one foot in the art world and one foot in the suicide prevention world, it fascinated me, the work that they were doing. So I went to them and I said, do you want me? And luckily they said yes, because I'm not really sure what I was going to do if they said, mm, no, not today, thank you. What hospital rooms do is they create artworks within locked units, within mental health units that are usually completely inaccessible by the general public. They are places where patients see the walls, where staff see the walls, and sometimes visitors see the walls. They Hospital rooms came from a place when our founders, Tim Shaw and uh, Neve White, visited a friend who was actually admitted to hospital following um, a suicide attempt. When they visited her, they were absolutely distressed beyond belief at the conditions that she was in. It was actually adding to her mental anguish. It was not a place of hope. It was a place of deprivation and almost like a punishment rather than being a place of, um, that would give you hope at a time when you needed it the most. And they made a vow to do what they could to change the hospital environments in as many places as possible. And they are doing that. Here is um, photographer Pete, uh, Steve McLeod. And Steve actually is one of the artists who works with hospital rooms. But as you can see from this quote here, he, was, he had 
Ad had, had actually been a patient as well. So he knew how diff difficult it can be to find hope when you most need it on a hospital, hospital, um, in a hospital with corridors like we saw from, um, um, from Simon earlier. It was cold, it was clinical, and it was dilapidated. And I think when it comes to lived experience and inspiring hope through artworks, you can't get any better than working with artists who have lived experience of that environment, lived experience of that situation, but who can go on to create artworks within that, that space. And that's exactly what he's done. He has created the most beautiful um, environments that really have benefited patients, staff, and visitors. And who should have access to artworks? Again, if we are all, we all need hope, we all have those moments in our lives where we need to connect with art. We know that mental health um, can be improved and is often improved by the environment that we're in. It's meant to be a therapeutic environment. Often it's anything but. It's about not having the barriers to culture as well. It's about hospital rooms and together and all of our organisations and all of us individual have agency to change the environment that we're in. And there should be no barriers to culture, exactly as our artist says here, no barriers to culture. Hospital rooms are actually, um, have just been commissioned and are just about to finish a whole hospital. We were brought in to work at Springfield Hospital and we had 80 workshops with different artists and different um, patient groups and staff um, who we, we worked with to create artworks and create an environment that would be therapeutic and hopeful. For us, it's not just about living conditions. It's not just about what happens when a patient is admitted. It's about the working conditions for our staff as well, for our NHS colleagues, our psychiatric colleagues, our mental health colleagues. We also have a digital art school as well, which anyone can access. And again, it was really about there should be no barriers to people experiencing or living with artwork. So the digital art school is there as well. And again, people create at home and they have their materials. During COVID, we used to send materials out to people's homes and they would tune in online from their mental health units or from their homes and they would create together. And it was a wonderful experience and it was all via Zoom. Again, reaching in instead of waiting for people to reach out. Us going to people that we knew needed hope at a time of hopelessness. I just wanted to mention that um, when I first became a trustee of hospital rooms, I was very concerned about the artwork. I was, as a curator and as, as an art historian, I was really um, worried about the artwork. What happens if... Uh, what happens to the artwork if somebody takes it? You know, what happens if it becomes like a Banksy and someone chips it off the wall and takes it away? And the way that we dealt with that is that um, because the market value of lots of the artists we work in with is so high, and we know that the NHS is cash strapped, so we were trying to do something that meant that nobody was uh, tempted to sell a piece from the wall. Um, if any of the participating hospitals attempt to sell an artwork, we have an agreement with our artists um, and we agree that they will never authenticate that artwork. So it loses its value. The minute it's out of situ, it loses its value. And that was very deliberate because we wanted to ensure that the reason why that work was made, it was made in situ, it was made for a particular space. And for us, the relationship, the hopeful relationship between the artwork and the space was crucial. And we wanted to secure that. And there's no better way to secure that than to bring money into the equation. So that's what we did. One of the last examples that I want to share with you now is something that I came across. I was very fortunate to be awarded something called um, a Churchill Scholarship. Um, it was a few years ago, and they said to me, uh, you can go anywhere in the world and you can look at anything you want to look at. Well, it's very difficult when somebody actually says that to you. Um, 
What I decided to do was travel to America and travel to Japan and to have a look at artworks that are created by our untrained artists. Sometimes people refer to this form of art as outsider art, a term that I particularly hate. Um, it, there's nothing outsider about it. It's very much kind of at the centre of what we should be doing. I was interested in uh, untrained artists. I was interested in artworks that were created by people who may have experienced mental health challenges or physical health challenges. I was really interested in the honesty in that work that often comes through and is often processed out of us by art schools. I had the great fortune of being in New York. And in New York, there is a psychiatric hospital called Creedmoor Hospital. And Creedmoor was the place where people like Lou Reed found themselves um, and Woody Guthrie um, found himself. And it was a huge, expansive hospital, as big as any university campus that you can imagine, absolutely enormous with thousands and thousands of beds. I had the great privilege of visiting, they allowed me in. And um, when I got there, I realised that the central building in the hospital had actually been completely taken over. As, um, as in this country where we have lots of mental health care that takes, takes place outside hospitals now, um, the same things that decentralisation had happened in um, Creedmoor Hospital in, in Queens in New York. So they had these huge buildings. They had uh, a dining room that used to seat thousands of people at the same time. And they literally said to one of the psychiatrics, psychiatrists, uh, Dr. Janice Martin, uh, we're going to give you this building. What do you want to do with it? He created the most wonderful art school in the centre of Creedmoor Psychiatric Units. It is a place of so, such amazing creation. If you ever get the chance to go there, please do. All of the artists are patients. Uh, they are either inpatient still or they are day patients. And Dr. Martin created a movement called the Living Museum because it is very much alive. Th this movement has now spread all over the world and it really is a case of artists being at the centre of their own therapeutic environment. And the picture that you can see here is from a recent visit to um, the latest living museum to set up. It's now in uh, 20 countries ac across the globe. And this one here um, is actually in Switzerland and it's absolutely wonderful. But again, can you imagine every psychiatric hospital in this country having an art school at its centre? Wouldn't that be amazing? Amazing. So just to finish this evening, I wanted to go back to my own lived experience. For me, Kintsugi, the artwork um, that uh, was born in Japan, was created in Japan, where artworks are often, that are damaged, are often put back together again. And the, instead of hiding the cracks, the cracks are often accentuated with gold. And for me, that's what we do. That's how we create hope. It's not about creating artworks that hide our flaws, hide our scars. It's about creating artworks that show them, that make our lives useful again, make these pieces useful again, but not by hiding our scars, by celebrating them. I want to leave you with this quote. Um, it's actually a, a quote that was given to me by um, poet Lem Cisse, and I actually used it at the end of a TED talk that I did recently. But I thought tonight it really did sum up everything that Simon has talked about that hopefully I've made some sense about. I am not defined by my scars, but by my incredible ability to heal. Thank you.